I'm joined today by Rita Marie Rowland, Christiana Conrads and David Mucker of, uh, of PwC. David, just, just coming to you first of all, I mean, I, I know that there's been a, a, a recent study that you've done on the German market, but also has some, I think, interesting implications as well for, for the broader European market. Just let me know what the key takeaways were from, from this recent study. Yeah, sure. Thanks for this question, Richard. The study is called More Home, Less Office, and that might already give you an idea of the direction that you can expect. So for the first part of the study, we surveyed both German employers and employees and asked them about several aspects of working from home in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so what are the outcomes? I think in a nutshell, the switch from working in the office to working from home is seen very positively. So speaking in numbers, 71% of the employees have a strong desire to maintain working from home even after the pandemic has gone and thus employers expect a long-term increase of days of mobile working of 65% compared to the situation before COVID-19. And the other thing is that the majority of both the employers and the employees rate the productivity while working from home as good or even higher than before. Of course, there are also downsides in mobile working. We know that there are problems sometimes in the collaboration, in the exchange of information, data access, or home duties that prevent you from, from being productive sometimes. So on average, and that came also out of the survey, was that just over half of the workforce have the necessary technical equipment for a proper mobile working. So this is why firms need to invest in their people and in the infrastructure to uh, further improve the productivity, for example. And, and that's really interesting, David, because I, I would guess, at, at, you know, particularly at this kind of time, um, further investment um, isn't that easy to make. Um, do you have a sense of, of, um, of how high these costs are? Yes, uh, we have also asked employers to estimate those costs. And on the one hand, there are costs for like the provision of meeting rooms, digital infrastructure at the workplace, and making the space more flexible. So those conversion costs, as we call them, um, were estimated at an average of 220 euro per square meter, which I believe is at the uh, lower side of the range. Um, and this, of course, very much dependent on the concrete measures that you are planning. And on the other hand, for better hardware, IT equipment, IT training and such things, employers expect investments of approximately 950 euro per employee on average. And then, um, and that is a very interesting part of our study as well, because we have uh, uh, described a calculation model for cost saving scenarios when firms decide to reduce office space. So here you will get a very good idea of when it pays off to reduce actually space despite these initial investments that we just talked about. And um, because we have made realistic assumptions in this model, firstly, taking into account the outcomes of the survey. And then secondly, also by using uh, market driven input parameters. So it is quite realistic and really worth it to take a closer look at our working from home uh, cost saving calculation model. Were there any specific results that came as a surprise to you from, from the research? Really surprised me was the high level of acceptance of this working from home model. So we heard it before from various big companies, number of regular days for mobile working shall be increased and office space might be reduced and, and so on. But again, this extremely positive perception from both employers and employees from all kinds of industries and independent from the size of business, actually, that came a bit as a surprise for me. So um, I think you can definitely say that for many people in Germany, working from home has become the new norm. And um, most of them want to work from home more in the future. And most of the German employers most likely will and have to put them in the position to do so, actually. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to come to you, Rita. There's a lot of discussion in the market at the moment around, you know, the future of office and savings that could be generated. Um, but can office users 
really generate savings by reducing their office space or or, or does the sort of negative effect of initial costs um, really prevail in this? That's also uh, the question that our clients ask us all the time. Does it really make sense to reduce office space. That's why we created a calculation model to answer the questions for three different scenarios. And um, we have used on one hand um, market benchmarked input data for an average office. But on the other hand, we have used um, input data from our survey, uh, which David mentioned. One key output of the survey was that the participants said that they are planning to reduce um, office space um, in the amount of 20% in the future, which is a relatively high number. And um, we didn't expect that to be so clear in the survey. So we used um, these 20% in our calculation model and uh, used this as an input for reduction. In the first scenario, um, we had a look at a tenant scenario. So classically, the tenants or the office users rent out the spaces and uh, have remaining lease terms of 1 to 10, 15 years. And they are then reducing 20% of the spaces by giving back those spaces. And um, one of the results of the, the this scenario was that you can save 8% of costs over the next 10 years by reducing these 20%. But what you also have to consider or say for this scenario, it is very clear that um, it's the scenario outcome and the height of the saving is very much dependent on the remaz- remaining lease term and also the breakage fees, which you have to um, consider or take in mind. Um, For the second scenario, the office user is owner of the space and um, they are subletting or trying to sublet 20% of the spaces. And in this scenario, it is even more clear that you can generate savings in the height of 12%. So if you reduce your spaces by 20%, you can generate savings of 12% over 10 years. Um, So this came out for us as a surprise that the savings can be this high. In this scenario, the main driver of um, the savings or the costs are the reconstruction costs, which you have to um, have to take for separating the spaces from another, searching for tenants, um, reconstruction costs. So the reconstruction costs shouldn't be higher than 700 euros per square meters. That's also an outcome of our model. Um, The third scenario is a classical sale and leaseback scenario where um, the office user owns the spaces and tries to sale it and lease it back. So um, we advise the users to consider this scenario or the sale of the property only if the company is in need of liquidity because this scenario has the highest negative cash flow impact and savings can only be generated if the spaces are reduced by 30%. So this is really a high amount of space reduction. Um, and it sounds, Richard, as though um, this is going to be specific to you know, different considerations for different tenants, different owners in different positions. Um, I suppose what are the key considerations um, if you're a tenant or an owner um, that you need to look at before looking at reducing space? There are a number of really strategic questions which you have to ask yourself before considering reducing your space. For all scenarios, you have to ask yourself, how are you willing to accept the initial investment costs of the space reduction? Because they can be very high, but in the end, there can be savings. So you have to ask yourself, are you willing to invest in the first place? For tenants, um, you have to ask yourself how long is the remaining lease term and is there a possibility to negotiate with the landlord and um, therefore reduce the breakage fees. For owners, 
and who, who are planning to sublet, you have to ask yourself, are your spaces um, suitable for subletting? Is there um, actually an external demand for your office spaces? Are they up to date? And is somebody look, looking for these spaces? And at the, for, for the owners who are aiming to um, for a sale and lease back, are you willing to give up the ownership of your property and at the same time enter into a long-term lease agreement? And also, um, is it possible to achieve um, high sales proceeds and um, how high is the rent future rent level which you are locking in for a long term? Great. Thanks very much, Rita. Um, Christiana, just, just coming to you, if people are looking at, um, at the new work models, um, particularly for office, um, what are the key legal implications? Yeah, thank you, Richard. So, so you're absolutely right. So when introducing new work models, it's very important to consider several different legal aspects. So most of the properties are, are rented. So first of all, the lease agreement should be reviewed carefully. And in particular, the remaining lease term and also breakage costs are quite essential for the economic decision. And then also for tenants of agreements under German law, it might be favorable to review the lease agreements, whether there are any defects of the German statutory written form requirement, as the, such a breach might give the tenant a right for an early termination. And in addition to lease law considerations, companies should um, take employment laws into consideration. So basically any obligations and agreements for employees must be feasible and reasonable. And last but not least, it's about data security as well as data protection and um, protective measures need to be implemented to protect personal data and trade secrets and to keep the, yeah, the IT infrastructure of the company up and running. And what would be, I suppose, your key takeaways or, or, or best practice guidance um, for anyone looking at these kind of renegotiations of lease agreements? Companies are well advised to bear in mind that landlords are subject to several restrictions themselves. For example, so any conversion of, of office space might face limitations on public building laws. Then also um, some of the properties are subject to leasehold agreements and um, landlords face restrictions by investors or, or lenders, for example. And therefore, both parties are very well advised to work together in a collaborative way and to find solutions which basically give, give both of them more flexibility, and particularly in relation to the lease term and also in relation to the occupied space. I mean, that's interesting that you mention uh, ESG because that's obviously been a, you know, a, a very growing aspect in, in general, um, you know, during the high health crisis and after. Um, what's your sense of that, I suppose, um, just in terms of which criteria um, people should be taking into consideration? ESG considerations should be definitely an essential part of the overall decision making process. And one of the main ESG targets when it comes to real estate is to create better and more efficient spaces, so which are less harmful for the environment, but also with a big focus on, on health and well-being. And then ESG is also about the reduction of operating and life cycle costs. And this should all be taken into the account when looking at to, into new work models. Great. Thanks very much, Christiana. Very interesting study. What's your sense of, of the key things for the industry um, moving forward? I think it's uh, the message which should go out to all the decision makers, not only in the real estate sector, is um, that now it's a really good time to use this time to um, strategically uh, think about how the office of the future should look like and to use this time to um, strategically think about uh, how to move forward in terms of people, real estate and in interdisciplinary questions. David, what are your kind of key, key thoughts? I would also say that companies have to take a cross-functional approach for the office of the future and the workforce of the future because it's not only real estate and it's not only IT matters. So there are yeah, a broad range of, of other things that need to take into account. And these are like cultural people topics and um, yeah, legal to topics as well. 
So, um, yeah, and this all have to be considered when talking about the office of the future. And Christiana? What we see here is that, that um, companies are very well advised when they look at these new work models to consider all the different angles and to work in interdisciplinary teams. So in addition to aspects for yeah, economic aspects and strategic um, aspects, it's quite important to also look at the legal restrictions and um, look at it from a technical point of view. And as you just said, so last but not least, with increasing regulatory requirements and stakeholder demand, ESG standards um, also facilitate collaborative solutions um, as they provide for more transparency and more flexibility and in the end, resilience. Great. Thanks very much, Christiana. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, David. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing how this, uh, how this whole area of office versus home working develops. Thank you.